Hello, everyone. Welcome to ICC's Game of the Week with your host, as always, Joel Benjamin. Hikaru Nakamura is on fire. His victory in the prestigious San Sebastian tournament is his third major tournament win in the last few months and second in July. As I explained last week, Nakamura left early from the World Open to get to Spain just in time for the first round. If any of us expected a hangover for the first few rounds, Naka destroyed that notion by jumping out to a four and a half out of five start with victories over Karpov, Vallejo, Vache Lagrave, and San Segundo. Coasting in with four draws, Nakamura found himself with company at the end as Ruslan Ponomaryev caught him at the wire, both players on six and a half. The Blitz playoff played right into Nakamura's hands. Winning in style in the first playoff game, Naka put Pano in an, impress, in, in an impossible position, and Panamariev could produce no winning chances at all in the second game. Now, I'm naturally hesitant to analyze Blitz games, as the circumstances naturally produce more mistakes than usual. The quality of this one, however, was pretty good, especially for the winner. So let's see how these elite young grandmasters responded to the tension of this exciting game, which was carried live on ICC. Okay, so we have Nakamura playing white against Panamariev, and this was the first uh, playoff game of, of a two-game playoff, and if that had been tied, they would have gone to an Armageddon game. But uh, each player getting one game with the white pieces, and Nakamura drew white for the first game. And he opened with E4. Now, if you've been following Nakamura, and a lot of people on ICC have, he can open with just about anything, D4, C4, what have you. But I think E4 is really most natural for him because he is a pretty aggressive player, good attacking player, and he used E4 to good effect in this event. Aponomaria plays C5. And we have the Sicilian. And now E6, and this is a slightly rare bird in Grandmaster Chess these days, a straight Skaveningen or Schwenigen opening. Uh, this move order has kind of fallen out of fashion, mainly because of the carries attack, which is what Nakamura plays in this game. Now, uh, there is actually some justification for playing it in this situation because since uh, players don't get to play the carries attack that much anymore, uh, in a blitz game they may have to think a little bit uh, about what they're supposed to do. Well, that didn't really happen in this game, but uh, there is that thought to it. So after G4, black can play any number of moves, bishop e7, a6, knight c6, any developing move makes sense. Uh, actually, in my day, A6 was the main line, but of course, I'm talking about, um, you know, 30 years ago. Um, H6 uh, is perhaps the most common move these days, preventing white from chasing the knight away with G5. Now, white can pursue a strategy involving the moves um, H4, Rook G1, the idea of playing for G5, chasing that knight away. Uh, but it's also very possible for white to kind of just play an extended finchetto with bishop g2. And it's like he's playing a g3 variation, except the pawn going to g4 in one go. Uh, if he's going to use a pawn storm strategy, that could save a tempo. Black plays knight c6, and white just defends the g4 pawn with h3. Uh, black plays a6 now, and uh, a knight orf type move, and in fact, this position nowadays might even be seen more often from the knight orf, from the, uh, 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 a sideline that's becoming more popular, the h3 move um, on move uh, 6 against the knight orf, and we could get the same position. Now here, Nakamura just continues development with bishop e3. Uh, it's useful to note that here, or uh, a move before as well, 
Knight takes c6 is nothing because after e5, black can just play knight d5, put the knight in the way with a solid position. So bishop e3. And now knight e5. Uh, in most Sicilian, open Sicilians, a c4 square tends to be a bit tender. White always has to watch for encroaching knights. So after knight c4, first queen e2 to take away the square. And now a very, very interesting move, g5. Um, if you're not experienced in the Sicilian defense, that may seem like a horrible weakening move. But actually, it's pretty normal. The idea is to kind of clamp down on squares in the center. The knight on e5 can be chased away by pawn coming to f4. But after the move g5, white ever plays f4, there's a pawn trade and the knight does not get chased away from e5. The best that white can do is exchange it for another minor piece. So basically, this move cements that knight into e5. Now, there is, of course, a downside that after white breaks open the king side, probably with f4, uh, the black king is not going to be able to seek refuge on the king side. Maybe it can go to the queen side or stay in the center, but there's always the danger that the black forces aren't going to work together as well as the white pieces. Now, after g5 here, white can continue with um, castles. is uh, slightly more common than uh, Nakamura's choice, uh, but it, it often leads to the same thing. The only difference is that white has an alternative plan of bringing the knight to f3 to trade knights and then to push h4 and try to open up the king's side without committing his pawn structure quite as much. f4 was played. Black takes, of course. Bishop takes f4. And now knight f d7. This move is not strictly necessary, um, overprotecting uh, on e5 already. Black has an alternative method of development in bishop d7, uh, answering castles queenside with rook c8, in, in some cases with ideas of sacrificing exchange here. That's also another very thematic move in the Sicilian. And uh, there have been a few games that have gone in this uh, manner. But we see knight fd7, of course, the players have to kind of go on instinct. They don't have a lot of time to make these small decisions. This is a five-minute game, so they have to kind of hustle up out of the opening. So at this point, both players, you know, having taken, uh, you know, about half a minute, want to preserve that time for more important situations. So black advances b5, the typical move, with ideas of chasing away the knight in c3 and fincheroing the bishop. Queen f2. Uh, it certainly makes sense for white to get on the f file uh, right away. First, a, a prep move, king b1. And now rook f1. And this doesn't uh, directly threaten anything because the knight on e5 is protected by its brother on d7. But uh, black definitely wants to do something about that at f7 soon after bishop uh, e7. We see uh, bishop e3, and here I think um, the other plan in the position possibly is to bring the knight around knight c2, bring that knight to g3 and sometimes into h5, try to attack the king side. Of course, if white shifts everything over like that, then black can probably more comfortably castle queen side, so that's perhaps why Nakamura didn't go for that. So bishop e3, kind of putting the question to the queen. Queen c7. Knight to f3. So Nakamura actually plays uh, pretty sensibly in this middle game. He's basically just offering exchanges in the center. Black is proudest of his knights in this position, and uh, Nakamura just wants to do something about a strong knight in e5. So there's the first offer of exchange. He also has a bishop that can try to to get rid of the black outpost there. 
and after knight f3, here's rook h7. It's uh, at this point still overprotecting because uh, black, uh, as I said, has another knight protecting e5. But I think this move is going to be u is going to be necessary very shortly anyway. So rook h7, bishop to d4, and now b4. Perhaps you can question this move slightly that it may be a weakening of the um, of the queen side. I guess there is um, some argument that maybe black should uh, keep open thoughts of castling on the queen side and uh, be, to be able to connect the rooks, but uh, b4 doesn't seem to really be a mistake. Anyway, if knight a4, the knight is hanging around the queen side. Uh, we're going to see how it can be nicely redeployed later. And in some cases, again, the knight might come into b6 to trade knights. White, as I said, wants to break down black's control of the e5 square. So that's knight a4, knight to c4. And now, just a very sensible move from Nakamura, knight to d2. The black knight on c4 is, is quite annoying. Um, white has to be a little careful that um, black doesn't attack this knight on a4 with the move like queen to c6. Um, and then force b3, and then the knight can jump into a3. And aside from that, uh, the pawn on uh, e4 is uh, now attacked. Um, it was not attacked the move before because bishop takes uh, e4 could be answered by knight takes e5 and creating tactical problems on the long diagonal for black. So it's a knight a4, knight to c4, knight to d2. And now black could perhaps jump back to e5 with the knight. Um, then white perhaps might play knight to b6 and trade off knights in that fashion and maybe come back uh, and try to trade the second knight on e5, either with the bishop or with the knight. Well, rook c8, activating the rook on the c-file, and very often uh, having a little pressure on c2 can be very useful, keeping the white queen honest. And Nakamura trades. We see that both sides have preserved uh, more than half their time at this point, knight to b2, and now knight to e5. This might not strictly be a mistake, but I think it makes black's position probably a little bit more difficult to play. Uh, true, this knight is ready to come to c4. It's not necessarily that big a deal. In fact, black might consider playing a5 here, and if knight c4, then he gets that pawn up to a4, can create some... Um, attacking chances perhaps on the queen side. And also, it's important to note that black here preserves his option of the exchange sacrifice rook takes c4, similar to what was used in the game, but perhaps in a more favorable situation. Instead, we see knight to e5. And keep in mind... Panamarov didn't have a whole lot of time to think about that decision, but once he played it, uh, Nakamura pretty much immediately took on e5. Uh, he has a plan, and he's very confident in the execution. He brings his knight to c4, where it's creating some annoying problems for black, looking at the e5 pawn, looking at the d6 square, and plugging up the c-file. Well, now black has this exchange sacrifice available, and he goes for it. Probably not the right move, although the position is still not by any means decided. Um, it's a pretty tough call to make in a blitz game, but I think black is better off, let's say, playing a move like queen c5 and uh, not making that exchange sacrifice. If white plays queen g3, hitting e5, we could see f6, and then queen h4, and it becomes apparent that white has a very strong attack brewing. Uh, ideas of queen h5 check and taking the e-pawn in some lines. Also, rook takes f6 is in the air. And the knight on c4 is really blocking black's ambitions beautifully on the c-file. 
Uh, however, black does a lot better by not defending this pawn on e5. For instance, uh, just simply playing a5, and if queen takes e5, black can play uh, bishop to a6 with very nice counterplay there. And in fact, um, black is perfectly okay, possibly even a tiny bit better. So that's probably would have been the best way to play for black. Again, not a whole lot of time to make this decision. And, uh, you know, about a quarter of a minute to play rook takes c4. And Nakamura takes and, without hesitation, brings the queen into b6. Queen to c6. And now, of course, Nakamura does not think at all about trading queens. I think that would be really kind of a, a sinful move to do that because in this endgame, Black has plenty of compensation for the exchange. He has the bishop pair and also weaknesses in White's position. He has a lot of isolated pawns, some weak squares. Black would be very comfortable. Now, that's not the way to go about this. The advantage that White has is not so much uh, a rook versus a bishop in an endgame, but that... Uh, it's a position where the rooks can be quite useful. The exchange of pieces on e5 has opened up the d file, and that makes black pretty vulnerable there. Uh, for instance, already if black plays queen to c5, there's a nasty tactic. Rook to d8 check distracts the bishop and wins the black queen. Still, the game is, uh, is pretty tight. Uh, Ponomarev certainly has his chances. After queen a5, he plays f6 to defend the e5 pawn. And now this is a position where uh, my computer, uh, specifically Ripka, wants white to just um, double rooks on the d-file, move like rook d3. However, if black plays um, uh, bishop c8, Rook fd1, king f7. Not easy at all for white to breach the black position. Very often, uh, computers are quite comfortable giving a very nice evaluation, and the evaluation here is like plus 70 or 80, almost a pawn advantage for white. They're very comfortable with that uh, in a position give, where they give moves which don't necessarily have any clear plan of how you're going to proceed towards the win. Well, Nakamura has more of a clear plan. He plays h4. He wants to break open that king side. g5 is a significant threat. So Panamariev addresses that with rook g7. Bishop f3 with some veiled threats along this diagonal. And this is where black goes wrong. Panamariev makes really the first serious error of the game. Of course, he's only got a minute and a half on his clock, but uh, here he plays the move rook g8, and after that, it's pretty much over. He needed to start with the move king f7, and that would prevent the tactics that white comes up with next, and it's still a pretty tight game after king f7. Could really go either way. But, um, you know, thankfully, certainly if you're a Nakamura fan or you just wanted to see this game in Game of the Week, uh, Panamarev did not play the correct move. He played Rook to G8. And now Nakamura strikes. Not a very complicated um, combination, but after G5, H takes G5, a very pretty move. Queen takes pawn E5. Um, I was watching this game live on ICC, and I noticed a few <laughs> kibitzers not quite uh, getting what was going on and wondering if there was uh, some kind of uh, transmission error or indeed a mouse slip, uh, not realizing the players actually weren't playing <laughs> literally on the ICC. But the point, of course, is that if pawn takes queen, bishop h5 check, and uh, black is uh, stuck here because the d-files d-file and f-file, both controlled by the white rooks. There's no place for the king to go. Rook g6, bishop takes g6. A rather nice checkmate. Well, Pano could see that. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, 
after averting the mate, he's still in very big trouble because that, that pawn in e5 was a big hit to take. Now the center is much more wide open. And in fact, the, uh, the king side is quite a bit easier to attack. Uh, here he plays king f7. And without too much hesitation, um, Nakamura played uh, queen back to g3. Now, it's interesting. In this position, my computer started to go a bit crazy with bishop g4, trumpeting that it was the end of the world for black. But after uh, I let it run for some more time, it proposed that after rook to c8, maybe the position isn't that bad. Rook to d2 to defend the c2 pawn. King g7. Queen takes e7. And in this position, white only has a serious advantage. Well, probably winning in the long run, but not checkmating, which I'm sure Nakamura wanted to do very much, not give um, his opponent any chance to come back. And uh, probably Nakamura was correct in his decision, queen to g3. Um, very often, these just sort of solid moves to continue the attack are just the right thing to do in a blitz game, not leaving uh, yourself uh, any necessity to calculate too many variations. Just putting the pressure on your opponent, Black really has to constantly calculate. He's under threat of attack with every move. Now, after queen to g3, um, Black is really struggling to stay in the game. Um, the best defensive move seems to be queen c8, leaving only a clear advantage, but perhaps not yet a winning advantage for white. In all likelihood, it would have been very, very difficult for black to defend this position in the long run. Uh, instead of uh, queen c8, if black wants to try to get active with rook to c8, white has a nice move, simply queen g2, defending everything and uh, maintaining all the threats. In fact, Black also has to be a bit careful now about pawn to e5. Well, Ponomaryev tried to uh, find an active solution to his bronze g4, which uh, prevents White from further opening the position with uh, uh, h takes g5, which White was threatening, or probably uh, more uh, accurately to play bishop h5 check and h takes g5. But after g4, uh, Nakamura had been prepared for this and uh, knew that he could take on g4, did it right away, did not worry about the pin. And I think that Ponomaryev may have originally intended queen takes pawn on e4, then noticed that bishop h5 check is crushing because after king f8, white has queen b8 check sneaking in the back door. And then after king g7, rook g1, well, that just basically ends the game. So after bishop takes g4, well, maybe rook g7 is the best move just to kind of keep going. Rook g1, king f8, h5 would be one continuation. Um, that h-pawn is uh, helping out the white attack by distracting that the black rook from defending on the g-file. Probably white is going to crash through within the next few moves anyway. But the game came to a real sudden thud, if you will. If the bishop takes g4, queen c5, guarding that check on h5. But uh, Ponomaryev, uh, of course, in his last minute of the game, uh, neglected that bishop takes e6 was another direction in which a strong check could come. The queen moved away from defending that. And indeed, uh, we're going to have checkmate in just a few moves. King takes e6. Queen takes g8. White doesn't necessarily need a checkmate here, but he does have one. Rook f5 check. King takes e4. Queen g4 check. King e3. And then white can end the game with rook d3. Would be a rather brutal finish uh, using all the heavy pieces to uh, deliver the final blow to Black King. But of course, after Bishop takes e6, it was obvious to Ponomarev he didn't need to be shown that checkmate. And he gave up. So Nakamura, with a very brutal, decisive win in that first playoff game, 
And the second playoff game, Ponomaryev really played without any kind of heart or spirit. Nakamura got um, a better position very easily, um, did offer a repetition late in the game. Of course, a draw would be as good as resigning for Ponomaryev, and Nakamura ended up winning that second game as well. But let's not forget how he stormed out with four wins in uh, the slow chess portion of the event, uh, plus four result, uh, just um, continuing Nakamura's incredible run. Uh, he won this, he won the World Open, or tied for first there at any rate, and of course he won the U.S. Championship back in May, and uh, he's not only winning tournaments, he's also making quite a bit of money doing so, and uh, in just those three tournaments probably earned more money than an awful lot of chess players make in one year. So kudos to, to uh, Hikaru, whose rating I think is probably up to around 2730. Um, I think uh, the up-to-date ratings have him number 17 in the world, and we will definitely be seeing him in upper echelon tournaments. Uh, he's uh, invited to a big tournament, a major tournament in uh, England the end of the year, and I think he's going to be in chorus beginning of next year as well. So... Um, uh, Nakamura, who's quite popular in the ICC, has played many, many games here. We're going to get to see a lot from him in the in the near future, and uh, it is looking looking good for the young man. So we'll be uh, seeing how his progress continues. In the meantime, like I said, another big win for Nakamura in the uh, San Sebastian tournament. Uh, Panamaria, a very good result tying for first, but... Uh, the playoff, uh, he was just no match for Nakamura, who, of course, is a great blitz specialist. Well, that wraps things up for another week. Uh, as always, I'm Joel Benjamin. It's a pleasure bringing the action to you, and I hope that you'll join me next time on ICC's Game of the Week. Mm-hmm.